Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for another very special edition of Wowza Live with our host, Ned Dennison. Ned? Hello, everyone. I'm the chairperson of the International Marathon Swimming Hall of Fame. <coughs> Excuse me. We have one of our honorees with us today, Dr. Christopher Stockdale, MBE. Say hello, Christopher. Hello, everybody. Nice to see you. Um, tell us about your swimming before you, uh, you entered the English Channel in 1977. Well, I first learned to swim when I was just five years old. I was on holiday in Devon and um, I was encouraged to carry on because my brother Ian was an absolutely amazing swimmer. And life was very simple in the 50s. You know, my life revolved around school, the church youth club and Northfield Swimming Baths, which was three miles down the road. So I swam a lot because my brother was swimming and I went along with him and everything. And he won the Birmingham under 11 one length championship. And of course there, after that, it became my ambition to emulate my brother. And four years later, I did, I did emulate him. It's one of the only two races I've ever won in my whole life. Anyway, um, I kept on swimming, swam for the school. And then when I was 13, I was asked to go, this was the mid fifties, for a trial for a one week swimming course. Now in those days, swimming courses were extremely rare. So this was a big thing. And I had to go along to the pool, swim up and down a few lengths and they would come and talk to me. Anyway, I dutifully swam up and down a few lengths and stood very proudly at the shallow end, you know, waiting for this chap to come up to talk to me, which he duly did. And he said, um, hello, Stockdale. He said, uh, nice to meet you and uh, thank you for coming. But just to let you know, you'll never be a swimmer. <laughs> well, you can imagine a 13 year old lad, Ned, that was, that was curtains for me. I kept swimming for the school. I did a lot of athletics and then uh, when I was 17, I was a little bit young, I went to university and everything absolutely stopped, absolutely stopped. And then when I qualified in 67, I was, I did surgery for four years, no opportunity to swim or do anything. And then in 1972, I went into general practice, um, which I had a, a wonderfully, very happy career in. And then in 1976, I was approaching 16 and a half stone, and I thought I've got to do something about this. So I got my old woolly trunks out of the drawer, went down to the local pool and started swimming. And I, the pool was so crowded in those days. I used to swim widths, and 125 widths was a mile. So I swam a mile two, three times a week, dodging and weaving across the width. And in October of that year, I went into reception and there was the poster for the annual swimming gala. And I thought, I think I'll have a bash at this. So I looked down the list of possible things that I could enter for. And there was under 15 boys, 100 meters, under 18 men's 100 meters, senior men's under 22. And right at the bottom was the only race for which I qualified by virtue of my age, which was the veteran one length men's handicap race, which I duly entered. I was soundly beaten by a 65 year old Welshman who had to be helped onto his blocks. And he, I started a second ahead of him and he still beat me. But I won and I've got it to show you this little silver medal. And this is real silver. You don't see them real silver anymore. And that was the start of my journey. I was in the pub that night with a, a friend and um, we were having a little drink and he said, you're far too, too old for sprinting, far too old. I was 34. He said, why don't you try long distance swimming? Why don't you try and swim the channel? And that set the cogs working. I hadn't got a clue what to do about it. I knew nothing about it at all. I went to Hudson's in town and I found this book. 
Margaret Jarvis's book. I don't know if you've seen it, but it became my Bible, my absolute Bible. And there were some great pictures in here. There was a picture there of a young stalwart called Kevin Murphy, who you might recognize. And I read that he'd swum across Lake Balaton, 60 miles and all sorts of things. So he sort of was already a demigod before I even met him. There was also a picture of a sweet lady, if I can find it quickly, called Claudia McPherson. And that suggested to me that swimming the channel was going to be tough because <laughs> she looked so ill. Anyway, this became my Bible, this little book. So I started training, self-taught, started doing, um, you know, a little bit more. And in Solihull, there was a Lido, which was badly used because it was unheated. But it was great because it was 44 meters long. So I got permission to swim in the Lido early morning, no, no attendance, nothing. And I used to go down to the Lido at half past six every morning, climb over the fence and swim two miles before I went to work. And that was my routine. I had no idea what swimming the channel meant. I wrote to Audrey Scott. She sent me a big lump of documentation, which I read through which gave me more understanding. And I thought to myself naively, I thought, well, the channel's 20 miles long. If I can swim 10 miles in the Lido, I can probably do 15 on the day, and then who knows? And that was my starting philosophy for swimming the channel. So one day I went down to the Lido and I did my 400 lengths which was the 10 miles, took me absolutely ages. And there was a full length mirror by the side of the pool. And I got out and I looked like a 70 year old man. I looked like I do now. And I was absolutely whacked, but I'd done my 10 miles. And I did a fortnight sea training. And then I booked to swim the channel in September of 1977. My brother Ian had just finished building a beautiful 29-foot boat, Psyche of Hamble, and offered to pilot me across the, the channel. It was my good fortune just before I swam to meet Ray Scott, who not only became one of my very, very dearest friends, but would in future accompany me on all my swims. I cannot begin to tell you, Ned, how much I loved Ray and Audrey. They were just wonderful, wonderful people. And one thing that Channel Swimming misses today is Sunnybank. I don't know if you ever went to Sunnybank, the house where they live. It was in Hawkins Valley, just up from Folkestone. It was a mecca for Channel Swimming. The door was always open. And coming up and down the drive all day would be international channel swimmers from all over the world. If you went to Sunnybank, you would see every swimmer coming for a cup of tea at some time or other. Audrey and Ray were just magnificent. Anyway, the swim was booked. Um, I'd done no other marathon swims at all. I'd had a little dip in the sea in North Wales and uh, done some coastal swimming, which stopped very abruptly when the Coast Guards were called out to assist me when they thought I was in trouble. So that caused some concern. But essentially, I was getting into the water totally naive and not prepared for what would come. So I want to stop, I want to stop you there, Christopher. Hang on, I want to stop you there. Um, so a couple of things. Um, first of all, um, Christopher, you, uh, you were good enough today to volunteer for the mentoring program. Yeah. So, so, so poor sods like yourself in the future. We'll hopefully have somebody to talk to to give them a little bit of heads up yeah. and, and and on your channel swim i want to i want to set the scene for this swim uh many years ago i worked for a company and was the the person dealing with a formula one team as an official supplier and i asked the owner of the team at one point you know what's the what's the perfect design for a car and he said oh that's simple he goes as the formula one car finishes 
He said the driver's neck is broken from the excessive G-forces. All four tires pop at exactly the same time as they cross the finish line. It's completely out of petrol, including the fumes. And mm. every single piece of metal in the car has now suffered metal fatigue and snaps. <laughs> So I, I, I'd always, I always remember that. It just seemed kind of a, a, a dramatic sort of finish to a, a Formula One race. So I, I want you to give us a very high level of your, of your first swim. Don't go too far into detail and, and get to the end quickly because I got a lot of questions for you. Okay. Well, um, the swim started early morning. Beautiful flat calm sea. And off I went and uh, plodded on quite well. And by early afternoon, I'd done my 10 miles and I was still progressing reasonably well. And then the weather changed. And suddenly we went from a one to two to a three to four with some cresting of the waves and it just got a little bit more difficult. It would later become a five to six. And then it started to rain. And then something completely unexpected happened. I hadn't even given it a thought. It went dark. And that was a real surprise to me. So suddenly I was swimming in the dark with a 40 watt bulb on the side of the boat, no contact lenses. And I can honestly say, Ned, the next few hours were absolute hell. They were really awful. I just retreated into this really strange, cold, greeny world of disorientation. And I would swim to the boat and my dear friend Graham, who was a colleague of mine, would call me to the boat, the boat would then move away and I would swim to it again. And this went on for hour after hour. Eventually Ray said, swim for it, Chris, you've only got 50 meters to go. I swam and swam and swam and my left big toe touched the sand. And I can still feel that sand on my toe. It was half past two in the morning on the French coast. I crawled ashore. Uh, 17 and a half hours it had taken me. Um, the wind was blowing. It was very, very rough. And my, my brother left the boat um, to come and find me because he knew I wasn't very well, which he duly did. I held on to his feet. He got me back on the boat again. I just got on board and there was this most terrific thump. And the boat was hit broadside. Uh, by a very big wave which lifted it in the air and it dropped down again on the tiller. Ian went down to try and free everything up, failed miserably and unfortunately the propeller shaft broke. So we were in shallow water in a five to six on the French coast, the boat was on its side and we all had to make our way to, to shore again. I think I'm the only channel swimmer to ever make the landing twice in the same swim. <laughs> swim. Anyway, we got on shore. I was very, very cold and I rapidly uh, slipped into unconsciousness. I was saved by my dear sister-in-law, Jackie, Ian's wife, who dived on top of me and kept me warm and everything. And eventually I came to, but the bottom line was we all ended up in Calais Hospital. <laughs> And Ian's boat um, sadly drifted onto the rocks. They sent out a French um, vedette to try and get Ian's boat off the rocks. The vedette failed and itself got into trouble and they had to send out another boat to get the vedette back. So Ian's boat was left and the following day there was not one bit of it to be seen. And this was its maiden voyage. Uh, Ian was absolutely wonderful. To this day, he has never grumbled about it, which is amazing. Has he, has he ever spoken to you again? <laughs> oh, yes, he has. <laughs> Ian's my hero. So that was it, Ned. We all came back, a rather disheveled crew, um, and, and there we were. I've made it. You know, it was, it was wonderful. So there we go. So next time some channel swimmer tells me about the waves were this or the jellyfish was that and the blah, 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 blah. I'm just going to ask them, did the boat sink? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good starting point. <laughs> so, so you went on to uh, do literally 30 years of global marathon swimming. A couple of more English Channel successful crossings, a couple of heartbreaks. 
yeah. uh, Capri, Naples, around Manhattan, a lot of the British Long Distance Swimming Association swims, Lake Erie, mm -hmm. Lake Zurich twice, you've got a 24-hour club, 51.5 kilometers across Lake Garda, mm -hmm. um, and some of the first ever Italian swims that have been done. Yeah. Tell us about your proudest moments, your biggest challenges, and, and the most fun you had. Well, I, I suppose with regard to pride such as it is, I suppose the first channel swim obviously is really important. The next most important swim, both in terms of achievement and in terms of camaraderie and making lifelong friends was Capri Naples in 1982. I wasn't good enough to be invited. I just wasn't good enough. But Audrey had a wild card and asked me if I'd like to go. And it was on that swim, at swim of course, that I met Albert Coward, who was effectively my boatman. And we became instantly the dearest of friends. And as you know, Ned, that's a friendship that's been sustained until this day. Um, towards the end of the Capri Napoli, um, I was well behind the others. Paul Asmuth won in six hours 35. And I was 200 yards from the flare on the buoy in the, in the harbour in Naples, and the flare went up, you see. And I thought, oh, blow it. Anyway, I kept on swimming. Everyone was arguing around me, and I could see Albert waving his arms and gesticulating. I thought, well, just keep swimming, keep swimming. And I turned round, and behind me was the big Navy gunboat, which follows in the last swimmer, a big boat. And on the bow of the gunboat was General Zorkani, scowling at me, you see. I kept swimming, kept swimming, and I turned and looked over my shoulder again. And this time he wasn't scowling, he was shaking his fist like that and smiling. And they let me finish. And there were thousands of people there, and it was a fantastic finish. It really, it really was. And that failure stroke success <laughs> was the start of the invitations that came in to swim here, there, and everywhere. And I, I always loved my swimming. It was always joyous. I never expected to win. It was just a matter of the old-fashioned principle of getting from A to B. But in between A and B, there would be wonderful, wonderful adventures. I mean, Albert and I have shared the most amazing adventures over the last 40 years. Um, that was the first one that we shared together. Um, Albert was actually coming on Lake Garda, but he wasn't well in the winter, so he couldn't train for it. But he was on my boat with me. As you know, we both swam together across the, uh, the Bay of Naples. It took us two years to organize that swim because getting permission from the naval authorities was an absolute nightmare. Um, and it was just a wonderful story. You know, we met at midnight at the Castello Aragonese in Italy, which is a very romantic place. It's beautiful there. And, um, and a small crowd of us on, on, the, on the jetty. And the pilots, two pilots, uh, Franco Moroni and Domenico, I've forgotten his name, Moroni, I think was the other one, um, suddenly decided they wanted more money, which is very Italian, you see. It's really wonderful. It's Italian. So Albert and I shrugged our shoulders and left it to our friends to negotiate the money. And in the end, they said, oh, they would just give it a few hours and see how we went. So we set off and um, it was pitch black, of course, midnight. Um, I swam fairly well and I was a little bit ahead of Albert by noon the following day. Um, the sea was good, it was absolutely fine. When suddenly and unexpectedly, <laughs> I fractured a rib. I just extended my arm, heard a crack, and my rib just below my shoulder blade cracked. And that made swimming extremely difficult. I discovered I could do a few strokes breaststroke and then 30 strokes freestyle. And that was the way it was going to be for the next six hours. Albert overtook me and he finished 20 minutes ahead of me. And I was thrilled about that, thrilled, because this was, this was Albert's territory. And it was only right that Albert should win that swim. It was brilliant. There were 
And was the, was the boat okay afterwards? It didn't sink? No, it didn't sink. <laughs> okay, just checking. <laughs> and we had a fantastic welcome. There, were, there must have been 1,500 people there. There were banners and roses, and it was really amazing. So that was a great swim. Uh, Lake Garda was a great swim. It was a tough swim because we had wind against for a long time. It was very, very lengthy. But again, fantastic pals on the boat who just stick with stuck with me. It was really, really great. So that that um, really stands out. Some of the failures stand out. Lake Ontario, which failed after twenty odd hours, was a wonderful example of friendship and unity and all coming together and doing their very best for me. But in the end, it was it was not to be. So. I treasure these friendships that I've made, Ned, over the years. They've just been wonderful. And uh, when I look back, I, I feel blessed that I had this opportunity to not only have a, a really happy career, a career that I felt was worthwhile, but also to have this other side to my life, completely divorced from medicine, which has given so much pleasure. It's just impossible to, um, to quantify how much pleasure it's given me. But out of it all, deep, deep friendships. I mean, I still bitterly miss Ray and Audrey, who've, who've passed away, as you know, uh, long ago. And I really miss them. And uh, gradually, as time goes on, other friends pass away as well. And it's very sad. But I, I have this massive collection of wonderful memories that uh, sustain me through their losses. One of the, um, the hallmarks of your swimming an athletic career is, is how much you've given back to sport and society. Talk, talk to us about your role, um, your medical role with the Channel Swimming Association, what, what you did and, and what you're most proud of. Yeah, well, that started uh, in 1980. After my channel swim, um, I still knew nothing about channel swimming or anything about channel swimmers. But what I did know was that I was friends with Ray and Audrey. And this led to me going down quite frequently to stay with them at Sunnybank. And there was a medical officer in place. His name was Eric Mallett, who lived in Folkestone. Um, but he'd been doing it for a long time, so I agreed to share his duties. And then it became apparent to me after a while that the medical process just wasn't thorough enough, really, because swimming the channel or any big body of water is risky, as you, as you well know. Um, so I devised um, a full a system of full medicals, which I think drove everybody potty to start with because it was quite convoluted, involved, and it needed chest x-rays and ECGs under certain conditions. But we got that going, and in the end, it was extremely successful. And when I look at modern medical forms now, I all smile because I can still see the imprint of my original form on the on the newer ones it's quite nice so i was very proud of that because i think that did help um sadly there were still one or two deaths in the channel but nothing really to do with the medical examinations the medical examinations were all sound and then later with the guidance of uh, michelle verroken who ran the british drug testing uh, department i introduced drug testing into channel swimming semi-successfully it was very difficult to manage because you needed blood or urine samples at the end of a channel swim and it was really not very practical but we did our best with it we only got a few tests done but they were all negative and whatever else the the possible threat of a drug test was there which might have deterred a few a few people from taking stuff but drug testing and marathon swimming, unless you've got a lake where you can get from one end to the other easily, in open water, it's really difficult to land on the tired swimmer and you need a, a recommended person to do it and take the appropriate sample. So it's, it's tough. But we did introduce it. I think it was worthwhile. And um, I carried on with that for about 20 years and uh, you know, felt quite proud of all of that, really. The second area you contributed in greatly was raising money for charity. <clears throat> I guess the first question is, wh where did that that drive to raise money for charity come? Was that was that uh, 
uh, parental influence? Was it church influence? And this this culminated in you heading off to the palace and the queen awarding you the MBE. So you you clearly were at it for a while. I blame everything on my mom, Ned. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yes, it's it's the quality of empathy. I think it perhaps it comes from being a doctor. Um, I like to think that I cared about my patients. I, I certainly believe that I did. I practiced in what I would call the halcyon days of general practice when I had my own personal list. Um, there was continu continuous care. There was out of hours service at nights and weekends. Um, all my patients had my phone number, all two and a half thousand of them. It was the, the, the comprehensive feeling of being a family doctor. And it was very busy. Um, I got tired, I got grouchy, but Ned, I loved it. It was a really, really worthwhile um, career. Um, one of the little perks that I had, I, initially I embarked upon a surgical career, but when I went into general practice, my colleagues very kindly let me do one day surgery a week. And I started putting in shunts and fistulas at the renal unit at our local general hospital. And it soon became obvious to me that the real unit was struggling for funds. And when I decided to swim the channel, I thought, well, perhaps we could use this as a vehicle for raising a few bob. And in the 1970s, sponsorship was quite unusual. The principle of asking someone to give you so, some money for doing something was a bit unique. There weren't many people at it. And the principle of the first channel swim was to give so much a mile. Anyway, we ended up with hundreds of sponsor sheets, all absolutely full of names and promises and everything. And it was very successful. It raised in those days a lot of money. And then that sort of just sowed a seed of continuation really, because wherever I looked locally, I always raised for local needs, or at least in the main I did. Um, there was always a need and whether it be the children's hospital or the local disabled club or whatever it was, I didn't have to look far to find that folk were struggling. And so it all seemed um, reasonable to make the bigger swim, it's not every swim, just the one big swim a year um, as a sort of charity event. And they waxed and waned, some did very well, some didn't do very well. Uh, the Mallorca Minorca swim, which I failed miserably, <laughs> actually did the best it was interesting <laughs> um so one thing just led to another ned and um that was great it was really wonderful and of course margaret as you know had uh, breast cancer at the age of 38 so that led to an association with the breast cancer unit and my colleagues there so we we raised a lot of money for the breast cancer unit as as margaret did too when she swam lake zurich um and her story, or read, Ned, it's, it's, it's inspirational. And it's one of the reasons that I, um, I wrote about her, because not only is my book a love story, but it's also an example, perhaps, to other ladies who are suffering of what can be done um, when you're poorly. So you, you've just published your book, and I'm, I'm taking full credit for it. Um, I, I got my copy yesterday, uh, just in time for the interview, and, and was able to read about that boat disintegrating, which was which was great fun. So I'm taking full credit for for lighting a fire under you. But tell tell us about the the motivation to write the book. Uh, tell us about how you you went back and grabbed those memories, and then any surprises you got along the way of of putting together an autobiography. Yeah, it, it actually all started not so much uh, with swimming, um, but with my bike ride. In, in 2005, I cycled to Athens, and I kept a daily diary of that bike ride. And um, when I got back, I started to put the diary together in, in, in a more essay-type form. And then I started to expand it laterally. I've always kept things. I've always kept newspaper articles photographs, my memories are very vivid, and it just started with from my first channel swim, raided the most wonderful swim logs, all of which I've kept, so that enabled me to relive the story, and I've got the insurance reports from my brother's boat, and that sort of thing. <laughs> 
So one thing gradually led to another. It took a long time because when you read it, you'll see how much detail is there. There is a lot of detail there. And as I say, right at the beginning, everything is absolutely honest. There is not one untruth there, um, which is why if you so correctly said, I won't get through the pearly gates, but there we are, that's life, isn't it, Ned? Um, so it just really expanded, Ned, and as I kept writing, um, it developed different sections. It developed the channel swimming section, the Italian section, Margaret's story, and then what I call the Greek section, which is the swim from Delos to Paros, and my cycling to Athens, and it just sort of gradually expanded. And I enjoyed it because I was reliving these memories, and not only was I reliving them, I was making them accurate, and that gave me a lot of pleasure. And within the text, there are a dozen biographies. I mean, as far as I'm aware, no biography has ever been written of Ray and Audrey Scott. And there is a 10 page biography there, which I think, which I know their daughter Fee is pleased with, and which I think does them credit. I don't think anyone's ever written a biography of Jerry Forsberg. I mean, can you believe that? Such a giant figure in a sport of marathon swimming, and there is no Jerry Forsberg biography. So I felt it was really important to devote a chapter to Jerry, who you know, it was just the most wonderful character. I mean, I can tell you such stories about Jerry. Do you know, before his channel swim, I think it was 1957 or 53, in the, in the three months before his channel swim, he swam 729 miles in training in the three months before. I mean, it's just the mind boggles. And I've got this wonderful description. I've been going to the pub the night before for a few pints of ale and some fish and chips before he swim the next day. I mean, it's a different era, Ned. It's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. So I felt um, it was important to put that down. And there are biographies of other friends, not swimmers necessarily, but important people in my life, um, to whom I wanted to pay homage, if you like, to our, our friendship. So one thing gradually led to another. <laughs> As you now know, it's expanded beyond belief and it's, it's now too heavy. <laughs> so I, I think uh, the title is Swimming with Hero. Yeah. Um, where can people get this or it, can they Google that, that name and it'll appear somewhere? It's, it's actually, Ned, on hospitalcharity.org. I'll email it to you. Okay. You can put it somewhere. And um, it's available from there. And the, the final question for you is, um, you've been involved in the sport uh, for 40 years. Um, when, you, when you look at today, the sport, and into the future, what do you think? What do I think? I think the, the basic thing is, of course, the distances remain the same. So the challenges remain the same. That's, that's, that's the basic premise. Things have changed. Um, the sea is a little bit warmer than it was. Uh, this century, it's probably about a degree warmer than it was in the latter half of the last century. That makes a slight difference to the challenge, just a little difference. Pilots, of course, have become very expert, but not only have they become expert, but their equipment has become absolutely amazing. I mean, when I did my channel swim with Reg Brickle Senior, uh, we swam in dense fog, a really dense fog. And Reg just had an ordinary radar screen and he'd just lean over now and then. He, was, he, he never moved from the wheel. He'd lean out of the window and say, just hang on, Chris. And I'd hang on and I'd dum, 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 dum. And then you'd feel the swell as this tanker went past and I asked him later, I said, that was close, Reg. He said, well, it went across the middle of my radar screen, but I thought I was okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that then was then. Now, for example, I was, I was observing a, a channel swim of Kathy Batch, a very courageous effort she made. And after 16 and a half hours, the pilot decided that maybe we should call it off. But I went downstairs to talk to him about it. And he had a computer downstairs which you could feed all the information into, and it would give you five possible 
results. Four of which, as far as Kathy were concerned, ended up still in the channel. But one, <laughs> one hit dry land. And I said, well, she's got a 20% chance of making it. Let's carry <laughs> on. And she landed after 22 and a half hours, Ned. Now, in the old days, that would have been, let's call it a day. Yeah. So techniques, uh, piloting, that's all absolutely going to become amazing. Weather prediction has become so excellent now. In 1977, we used to ask the Folkestone pilots what they thought. We're thinking they knew everything, but of course, they knew nothing. We'd ring up RAF Manston and we'd read the Times because we thought that was the best newspaper. <laughs> and that was that. That was our weather forecasting. So that's changed. I think for younger swimmers, uh, one thing that does worry me is the cost of events now. They are so expensive, Ned. How anybody can even think about funding an Ocean 7, I just, you know, it's just beyond me. Even in my halcyon days as a doctor, I could never have considered doing that sort of thing with all the money that was involved. So that worries me slightly because there may be some very fine swimmers who just can't afford the big swims. I mean, a channel swim now, I think, will cost anywhere between five and seven thousand pounds. It's got to be of that order of magnitude. You know, for a, a young uh, man or woman, is a lot of money. So that worries me slightly. I think we're probably almost at the limit of the challenges now. I think so. I mean, there will be other magnificent swimmers that people come up with, but I think we're near the end of, of maximum, if you like. I mean, the four-way channel last year was just a remarkable, remarkable effort. And possibly there will be a five-way channel, I don't know, but I think we're pretty much near the threshold of what can be achieved. And I think it's going to be difficult to come up with new innovative swims that are of a reasonable length you know, that can still be achieved. So I think the future is good. As you know, there is a lot of enthusiasm. There are far more marathon swimmers now than there ever were. The wetsuit, of course, has been a great aid to a lot of them. And I've got nothing about against that. I've, I've never worn a wetsuit, but people do, and that's fine. It's still a big challenge for them. Um, and I think that's absolutely great. And I mean, every year now up in Windermere, 5,000 competitors swim across Lake Windermere. Well, that's marvelous. You know, they're all wearing wetsuits. It doesn't matter. They're out there having fun, enjoying themselves. So I think the future is rosy. I, you know, I think it, it is a slightly different era. If I'm honest, I, I preferred the old days, but then also old farts always do, don't we? I mean, that's natural, isn't it? To, to look back and say I prefer the old days. Um, but it was, it's just been a great time that I, you know, I just can't tell you. Well, I'm perhaps telling you, I don't know. Christopher, thank you very, very much for your time today and we wish you all the best. Stay in touch. Thank you, Ned, will do.